14, 4 p.m. Ms. Vaught, call the roll, please. Ms. Avery? Here. Mr. Hetty? I am here. Mr. Moylan? Present. Mr. Croteau? Mrs. Chandler? Yes. Chairman Dake? Here. Would you please stand and join me in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Uh, we're on to number three, approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion. Do I have a second? A second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Th thank you. Hello. It's okay. Uh, number four, we're on to public comment. If you'd like to come up to address the commission, please come up and state your name and address for the record. The floor is yours for anyone that would like to come up. My name's Logan Smith. I'm at 1956 15th Avenue. I would, I, would, I, would, I would like to address the council and my fellow citizens because I've noticed some glaringly obvious faulty thinking when it's come to deciding if this rail should be, be running through town. And I have a, a, a few points. The first point is that Vero should have gotten a stop with this train. We, we should have done everything possible to lobby or petition for, for them to stop here. Now, I have, I've heard rumors that it was originally planned for that, but it was blocked by people within city council. I don't know if that's true. But I do know that it would have had a lot of benefits for this town. It would have increased our business dramatically, especially in the summertime, which is a slower month for us when our seasonal residents leave. I know that the population of Vero is growing much faster than the jobs are. And I know from people my age that it's very hard to not only have a job, but to keep a job in the off season. And I see people living in poverty in Vero if, uh, if all you do is just drive a little north or a little outside of town. And I know that having a steady flow of people visiting this town would dramatically incre uh, increase the amount of money flowing into here. The second thing I want to point out is that the problems that we are facing with this train, from what I've read from the previous minutes of the meeting, is that it would be a, dis, a, a disruption of, of our current life, that the noise or uh, blocking off roads for a number of times a day would be a disruption. But this is due to lack of planning on our part. We should have foreseen in the future that this train tracks would be used more often. And the fact that we are trying to block it is a failure on our own part. This deal has been talked about for many years. And the fact that we are, have been very slow with moving shows that we've been hoping that it won't, it, it won't go through, but that is not a way to run a town. And the third point that I think is most um, disturbing is that we think that mob rule can block potential business. And the problem with that is it's socialistic. This is private property that was bought before the, the, the town was founded in the 1800s. And the fact that we don't want it to be used more often and we are trying to stop that goes directly against free enterprise. Now, I understand that this company is applying for, 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 for loans from, for, from the government, and those loans come from our, our tax, taxpayer dollars. Nevertheless, this is a private business. And the fact that we are pulling out all stops possible to block it simply because we don't like it is very shocking to me. And I hope that we don't continue doing this. And all that I would, I, would, I would like to urge the council to do is to plan to be a city that will grow because our population is growing. And unless, unless we, we're wanting Vero in the next few decades to slowly sink, sink down into a place where nobody is able to stay here and the markets are plummeting, I urge us to find a way to not only let this rail happen, but to petition for eventually us getting a stop in town. Thank you very much. Thank you for your Mr. comments. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, not Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chairman. Sir, can I just uh, address a couple of the things that you said? Um, you said you heard that the city council uh, has done things to block it. Uh, I blame the city council for lots of things. I'm pretty well known for blaming the city council for things. And uh, um, the city council 
is not to blame here. I don't know if it was the, city council, but I was told that someone in the local government did. The city council has, to the best of my knowledge, has done absolutely nothing to block the railroad. This railroad commission has not done anything to block the railroad, unless some member of the commission knows something that, that I don't know. But no, sir, that's bad information you're getting. We have not done anything. We've, we've sat here and we've taken information in and we've, we've certainly all voiced an opinion one way or the other. But I don't think anybody up here has and said, I know we certainly have not taken a vote, on doing anything to block this uh, this uh, all aboard Florida, no, sir, didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public? Yes, sir. Hello, Haynes McDaniel, twenty seven fifteen fifty second Avenue. Just wanted to say that I appreciate y'all pursuing trying to get a train that we can ride through here. We've needed it for 51 years since the last one pulled out on January the 22nd, 1963. Uh, when I first came here, there were five trains a day each way that you could ride. And uh, we haven't been able to do that. I've been waiting to hear something from Amtrak for a couple of years since Amtrak and the state of Florida and the Florida East Coast apparently made an agreement to run an Amtrak or maybe even two trains through here. And I spent a little time this morning on the phone trying to find a human being that I could talk to on Amtrak. All you get is a computer. I, I did eventually get a human being and they gave me a phone number in Washington and it was a computer. It was Union Station, which uh, I recognize the address because I've been there a time or two. but. Uh, we do need to do what we can to encourage Amtrak. And uh, as far as all aboard Florida goes, I've written letters to them a couple of times with the suggestion that if they take Coco, Melbourne, Vero, and Fort Pierce and have each train stop in one of those four stations, it would add five minutes to the schedule of each train in each direction. But it would give us four opportunities a day to ride from Vero Beach to Miami and four opportunities to go from here to Orlando. So if we wanted to go to Orlando and catch a plane to California, or go to Miami and fly to South America, or go to Fort Lauderdale and go on a cruise, the opportunities would abound. And I think it would be helpful for everyone. And uh, I would encourage that we do whatever we can to have a resumption of passenger train service here. And I thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Anyone else from the audience that would like to comment? Yes, sir, come right up. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom Gruber, and I'm a uh, resident of Indian River Shores, and I've had uh, about six years' experience uh, working in a railroad project, uh, both before approval and after approval. But it was slightly different. It was a commuter rail, a little bit slower. But uh, I've been through a lot of the processes that you folks are faced with on this project, and I have a few comments uh, based on my experience I'd like to share with you. The first thing is that, uh, in my opinion, there are people uh, who don't want the train project at all, and I can understand that. The thought of the train coming is uh, somewhat overwhelming and daunting for a lot of people. Uh, my opinion is that the only way you can have any impact, we as uh, residents of, of this county and of this city, this town, can have any impact on that is through their financial uh, hopes uh, either uh, at the federal level through our uh, uh, congressional uh, representatives or senators or through uh, the state level uh, if the funds come from the state. Other than that, it's a private company who owns the right-of-way and to do anything with the project, uh, to halt it outright, uh, I don't think is going to happen. Uh, so that's, that's my comment on that. However, uh, there is a way that I believe that this commission can get the best deal they possibly can for the town of Vero Beach, and that is by paying very careful attention to the environmental impact report 
and the FRA's analysis of that report, uh, which will happen at uh, some time unknown uh, to us. Uh, I've looked at the environmental assessment, which has the same format as the EIS uh, that was done for the southern leg of, of this project. And uh, I've gone through that, and I think it's really important because not a lot of people understand the uh, details that have to be dealt with in the environmental impact uh, statement. And so I'd like to just briefly review uh, some of the sections in there. And, and the idea here is that we're going to need uh, some expertise skilled in each of these sections to understand whether the project's assessments there are uh, adequate and, uh, and, and represent the facts. Uh, and, and from my past experience, uh, a lot of these areas are areas where uh, the railroad project has hired a consultant from outside the area. And as the old Music Man song went, he doesn't know the territory. And so there's a lot of very local things that only you or people from this area can provide. And I think that's going to be the weakness in their developing the environmental assessment. I think there's a few other that I'll comment on as we go through it. But the first one, uh, this deals with the physical environment, uh, the first of which is air quality. So they're going to have to have a section on air quality. And we're going to have to be able to understand whether their assessment of air quality impacts from the railroad project is correct or incorrect, adequate or inadequate. And if it's inadequate, we've got to point out why and how. It takes a lot of technical expertise. Water quality. Uh, surface water quality, aquifers, well field protection zones. I'm not a, I'm not a full-time resident here, so I don't know where those things exist, but on the project we had, we had town well fields adjacent to the railroad tracks. Uh, we actually had to close some well fields uh, as a result of the project, and the project paid for drilling new wells. Uh, so we need people from uh, the water department, from the sewer department, who are familiar with water quality issues. Uh, water bodies and navigable waterways is the next section, which includes canals, waterways, both navigable and non-navigable, and a discussion of the impacts on those resources, if any. So we've got to know what the resources are, and we've got to understand what the impacts they're saying are versus do we think they're impacts other than those. Floodplains. I don't know if we have any floodplains in the vicinity of the tracks, but that's another issue that's got to be dealt with with local knowledge. Wetlands, same thing. Uh, essential fish habitat. Uh, I don't know. I know we've got a number of canals that will go under the tracks. Uh, I don't know if there's fish habitat in there that can be affected by the train, but we need to understand that and know whether their assessment makes sense or not. Uh, then we've got coastal zones. That's probably not as important uh, for our system, but uh, people like the coastal zone management can help us there if we have some issues. Uh, noise and vibration. Uh, and this is uh, uh, really how noise impacts are evaluated and how vibration impacts are evaluated. And in the this is a very formularized section of the EIS in that uh, there are very definite vibration levels uh, that affect uh, properties by class of use. In other words, schools or playgrounds or something have different levels, uh, hospitals, different levels of, uh, of, of disruption uh, based on noise and vibration. Those are, are all on the table uh, in in the EIS and how they're evaluated is important uh, and, and, and very fixed. So the issue there is have they, uh, have they identified all the sources that could be affected? Because they may not. We found in the project I worked on they missed some, some sources for vibration sensitivity and such. So uh, th that's really important. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, environmental consequences, uh, which really 
uh, summarizes uh, the net results. Then you've got biological impacts, which is the ecological systems, uh, plant life along the right of way, uh, and make sure that they've included any uh, assessment uh, effects on in, any endangered species, whether they be animal or vegetable, doesn't make any difference. Uh, but uh, we need local knowledge clearly there. Uh, does it affect any threatened or endangered species? Uh, are there any uh, uh, species that have to cross the tracks, for example? Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a situation on our project where we had uh, wetlands on either side of the tracks and there was a migrating uh, endangered turtle that would cross the track area. And they actually had to put tur turtle tunnels under the railroad tracks to accommodate them. And jokingly, we said traffic lights because it was one way and they could <laughs> control the traffic. Uh, uh, then the rail transportation, this is under human environment. The need to uh, carefully an uh, analyze the effects of increased freight train length and increased traffic, as well as the passenger traffic. And one of the things I happened to notice in carefully reading the EIS for the Southern Leg was they're talking about, I think it's in uh, 2035, going to a freight train length of over 12,000 feet, which has a massive impact. So that's really very interesting. So. And, and uh, then uh, impacts on roadways. That has to be, we need people that have local data about roadway usages, impacts mm -hmm. on the roadways. Uh, local vehicular transportation. Uh, land use, uh, details uh, compatibility with land uses abutting the tracks. Uh, demographics, reviews of impacts by race and income. They've got to do that. Again, we've got the local, in, the local knowledge there that they may not have. Uh, barriers to elderly and handicapped, that's principally a station issue. Uh, so with a train just whizzing through, that's probably not going to affect us uh, from a design of their project other than uh, perhaps pedestrian crossings. Uh, that would be the only place I could see that. Uh, contaminated sites and hazardous materials. If there are any uh, contaminated sites near the tracks, uh, will the project uh, increases affect those? I, I don't know. Uh, cultural resources, which deals with historic uh, uh, sites and archaeological sites. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, we found in our project. Uh, the project was woefully inadequate in identifying the potential sources for impacts. And again, if your inventory of, 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 of uh, uh, structures or places is inadequate, then the assessment of the impacts will be at inadequate. Uh, you've got uh, parks and playgrounds uh, have to be dealt with uh, and the impact on that. Again, that's local knowledge. Aesthetics. Uh, evaluate the aesthetic impacts, especially on historic resources. Uh, and, and that was a big one for us. Uh, and then uh, construction impacts, which is not in the overall perspective, I don't think that's such a big deal to some people it would be, but that deals with the noise and vibration and general uh, hubbub that goes with a construction project as it's in process, but disappears once the construction is completed. But they do have to talk about how they're gonna handle those things. And that could be very important uh, for people, particularly live along the tracks. Uh, and then uh, potential secondary and cumulative project, uh, impacts, which deals with things other than the project, where uh, the project accumulates an impact with those things. So again, that's kind of a wide open thing. So these are areas that very specific knowledge has got to be brought to bear. I think we're very lucky that from what I understand, the county is taking the point uh, on uh, noise and vibration. They're hiring a consultant to deal with that. But they're going to need the assistance of this commission to provide local input to provide the local aspect. Uh, the same thing is true of historic uh, and archaeological things. They're going to provide, uh, they're going to get a consultant to deal with that. And I think we're very, very lucky that the county has a, a very good handle 
on those particular things. And uh, as I said, uh, in the project I worked with, uh, uh, the uh, inventory of those things was woefully inadequate. And I would expect you'd experience the same thing on this project. So those are my comments uh, on this. Mr. Gruber, uh, in your experience, uh, you said that we're woefully inadequate. Uh, if, you're, if you locally can identify errors and omissions uh, in the EIS by demonstrating they've overlooked the, a, number of, a number of things, yes. uh, is the federal government uh, willing to consider those things? Or does that throw into question the whole EIS that, that comes in from it, the railroad? It does both things. If you, if you look at the historic and archaeological things, there's another body that comes to play in this, and that is the SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office. And they really rule the roost on that. They determine in the absolute what is historic. And uh, again, as I've mentioned in, in the past, that historic preservation applies to other than things that are on the National Register. It applies to anything that is eligible for listing on the National Register. And that's local knowledge because there's no place you can go to find that other than somebody who knows that stuff like the back of their hand. Well, it's very interesting because we have one of the oldest archaeological sites in the United States, in fact, in North and South America, Absolutely. which straddles this track. Yes. It's on both sides of the track. Absolutely. Yeah, interesting. And, 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 and now, another question I had. Yes. The, um, the question of the time in which to respond. Did you, you have the 45 days to respond, or did you get you know, an extension of that time? I, 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 we had much more time. Uh, oh. In our particular project, um, I wasn't as heavily involved in the general environmental impact as I was in the historic. A lot of the environmental stuff had happened before I got involved in the project, because that's very longstanding. But I can tell you the historic by itself was administered by the Army Corps of Engineers and took 22 meetings at two meetings a month. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that would be uh, that would be almost a year. Yeah. Okay. So you no two years. Two years. Okay. Yes. I traveled an hour each way from my home to Concord, Massachusetts, to the Army Corps Regional Headquarters. So having a two-year window of evaluating an EIS is not unusual. Certainly for historic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think, I think the uh, time frame that they suggested is, is wishful thinking. And my, the way this thing unfolds is my understanding is right now the FRA, who's going to administer the EIS, or evaluate the EIS, is, is sitting there knowing nothing, allegedly. In other words, th their job is to react to the report that the uh, project puts forth. The project hires a consultant, one or more consultants, and they put forth and generate the EIS. This goes to the FRA for evaluation. This is the point at which communities can weigh in and present testimony dealing with inadequacies. And I think uh, the more inadequate you can show it to be sort of wins points, I would say. Uh, because it throws into question the adequacy of the work that the project has done. And I think that's very important. I mean, what you're dealing with here is a strategy. Mm. And, you know, it's like in business. You, you, you have strategies as to how you're going to conduct your business. You have to have a strategy how you're going to conduct this. And, and again, I'm only one person, but I've been through parts of this thing and uh, understand a little bit how, about how it works. Okay. And, it, it, and, and there's a lot of local knowledge. This commission has got to find a way to bring to bear at the appropriate time. And, and the thing that makes it tough is we really don't know what the appropriate time is. Uh, if the, when the Southern Leg EIS was written, the project was at 30 percent design. I don't know what percent design this is we are right now because they're quiet. My understanding, they haven't yeah. even picked the design of the train. Don't even know, I have no idea where they're going to buy the trains at this point. Yeah, and that certainly yeah. would affect the noise and vibration mm -hmm. sources. Absolutely. So, you know, you might be looking at a year. Who knows? Right. So it's really hard to sit <coughs> energized for a long period of time waiting for the shoe to drop. But better now than later. 
So. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Anyone else from the general public that would like to address the commission? Yes, ma'am, come right up. Hi, I'm Melinda Meikle, 1612 West Camino del Rio. Um, I had a speech, I'm not going to give it, I'm just gonna do a few comments here. One reason a private train doesn't come through your neighborhood without approval is because of law. I mean, environmental impact study. They have to be approved first. And from when I've gone to the Treasure Coast Regional Planning and people stand up there, and the whole marine industry is possibly going to be forfeited because they only have five minutes an hour to bring their boats through you know, the, uh, the, the bridge gate. So then we look around the whole entire country and we see where passenger trains fail. They're under, they're over cost overruns, low ridership. So they've got to consider this when they're having a business model because it affects us as taxpayers. If they don't satisfy or they're not successful, from what I understand, the private then becomes public. So it's on our backs. We are now the stakeholders in their success. And I mean, I just pulled something off. The Panama Canal deadlock could cost the United States billions. There's a, a million, a billion six um, disputed amount of money down there, whether they're gonna finish it or not. And there's a big, so how do we even know? That's gonna put it off another couple years? We just don't know. Then I, I keep quoting California because the stimulus gave them $68 billion with another $43 billion to follow, and now they're scrambling with only $3.8 billion secured because Congress defunded them in 2011. The FRA is not allowed to give loans to California, so they are stuck. I think they're using cap and trade funds instead. So a RIF loan is capped out at $35 billion. So it just seems to me that the financial part of it is very important. I mean, we're not their company, but they should be able to prove to us that they're going to be successful so it doesn't re revolve, uh, come back on our shoulders. Um, there are other things that are seemed a little bit still dubious. Um, we've got right-of-way issues in the Cocoa area. Some of those may or may not be even finalized. I know they bought the Desiree Ranches as part of, of the ROW. Now that won't even go through until August of next year. So there's another thing, that's another time element there. Um, now when I spoke with one of the representatives of All Board Florida, they did say that eventually short haul and long haul trains will be crossing into our community. Do we have any say about this? If you're from the Midwest like I am, I know what a long haul train is. It's possibly an hour sitting out there. So is that just going to sneak up on us and we don't know about it? I mean, all these are so important questions to ask. Um, I just think that anybody who feels or is listening to this, who feels they have any, imp it will bear any impact on their lives, needs to express themselves now. Because when that EIS comes out, we're only going to have 45 to 90 days, and you know how time flies. We need to join together and really get some concrete ideas. I don't see why they don't go to the mid-state. It's less liability, less populated. Just my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else from the general public like to come up to address the commission? Okay, we'll close this part of the uh, meeting, the public comment. I'm gonna to bypass my chairman's manners right now, and we're gonna go right into presentations. We have Mr. Mike Busher here with Kim Delaney. Uh, Mr. Mike Busher is the executive director of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, and Kim Delaney is going to help him with the presentation today. He's not feeling too good, so she's gonna help him out here. So, sure. but thank you both very much for coming. Thank you for having us, both of us. She's gonna do more than just help. <laughs> <laughs> Kim has been working on this project um, for council staff for over two years. And the council's mission during this whole time is to been gather all the information we can, although it's not, it's not in, um, not in ready supply. I mean, we've been getting dribs and drabs. We've been attending their meetings. 
every meeting they've let us attend um, to try and get the word out about the potential benefits but also the potential impacts to, to communities like Bureau. One thing you should know um, about this project is that the city of Vero, I've heard some very um, thoughtful and very intelligent comments here tonight, and you should be blessed for the kind of folks you have in your, in your community who care a lot about what's going on with this project. Um, you're not alone in this. Folks from Lake Worth um, all the way up to Sebastian have expressed similar concerns. Uh, they just want to know um, what really is going on with this project. And I've heard comments about the timeline being ambitious. I would agree. And there's an awful lot of impacts that people are experiencing um, that Vero won't experience related to navigation and things like that. Um, I, uh, as I said, the council has been on a mission for the last two years to get the word out to everybody so that they absolutely know everything they can about this project. Because the gentleman who talked about the EIS, regardless of when it's issued, um, that will go really fast. Um, the review period we've asked as a, as a regional planning council, sort of a council of governments got together actually last month, and Kim will go over that with you, um, how they feel about this project at this point, uh, which is <coughs> a wait and see and gather all the information they can. The council has not taken a position on this project for or against, and we are certainly not lobbying for the project, which I've heard in, in certain circles. But um, we're trying to understand it, get the word out to the folks who, who like yourselves, like your city council, like the county commission, uh, up here and throughout the region, um, from Palm Beach all the way even up into Brevard. We've had conversations with those folks as well. Um, we've held numerous public meetings we've presented, and Kim will go over that as well. So you can understand the effort that's been made to date. Unfortunately, the amount of information is still slim. Um, I think it'll be like taking a drink through a fire hose when that EIS comes out, and we're going to have to assimilate all that very quickly. So um, whatever you can do to get ready for that, that's kind of been our, our mission. We're advising everybody, just as the gentleman who spoke earlier, just get ready for it because you have a lot of good local resources here. I think Kim wants to give you, um, uh, yeah, I guess if we can pass that out, it on I guess it was March 21st the Regional Planning Council um, which is Palm Beach Martin St. Lucie and Indian River made up of 19 local elected officials and nine appointees by the governor um, who really act as as to encourage communication among those local governments and and work like this identify project impacts that are greater than local in scope they um, wrote a letter to FRA um, asking them to please consider well, it's almost two dozen things in their EIS as they're preparing it. This is a little different because the FRA is actually preparing this document. They've asked um, FECI and All Aboard Florida just basically to stay out of it, um, that they'll be preparing it themselves. Um, not that they're not getting information from FECI and All Aboard Florida, but they're the, going to be the authors of it. So. The appropriate group is FRA, Florida Railroad, or the Federal Railroad Administration. So we, the council communicated, and it, the council didn't make this up. This council of local governments have been collecting comments for almost two years about this project. And we finally assimilated it into one place, sort of a central clearinghouse of everyone's concerns, at least to date. This project, it's awful hard to keep up because there's so many new things coming up, and we're doing the best we can to keep up with that. But Kim will go over that, that letter sort of the latest correspondence that we've received, um, not just from Indian River County or Sebastian, but from all up and down the line, um, we've received comments. Um, and very, again, very thoughtful that the level and the bar has been raised on the kind of comments we've been getting. So, I mean, we're very impressed as staff um, with those kind of comments. We'll talk to you a little bit tonight, or Kim will, a little bit tonight about schedule. Uh, where this whole thing is, where the Regional Planning Council is, and also an opportunity um, that at least the Regional Planning Council sees as an opportunity to have almost a central clearinghouse for information. Everybody is calling everybody. Everybody's getting different information. Uh, we, we've been working on a website that would provide 
the citizens, the elected officials, business, anybody who's interested, where they could go to one place and get at least the latest information that people are willing to post um, related to official documents um, related to this railroad. And also a list of, I won't use the word key contact, but contact folks, everybody from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the Army Corps of Engineers, folks who you'll be needing to talk to as this moves forward, and including your congressional delegation, the Treasure Coast legislative delegation, um, and anybody else you can think of. So we're going to try and develop that site as a almost an information clearinghouse for everybody just trying to make it a little easier on everybody because this is there's a lot of panic in in a lot of locations out there and we're just look keep your powder dry on this and let's figure out really what's going on because again the AIS will suggest the potential benefits but they'll also be looking at the impacts to local governments and citizens and businesses as well just got to make sure they do a fair job of that and that's that's my sort of introduction to Kim Delaney, who knows more about this railroad than I've ever, than I, than I would ever hope to know. She even has a, her phone chime is a, is a train whistle. So <laughs> I know when she's coming, I look for the train. And so um, Dr. Delaney is here to hopefully give you some new information. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Uh, for the record, Kim Delaney, thanks again for the invitation to address you as a commission. Um, what I distributed a moment ago, and I have, I think, another maybe 15 copies or so, so they'll just be available for the public. Also um, on is at, And it's on council's website and was distributed pretty broadly, um, is a summary of, um, of the council presentation, uh, rather the, the uh, council's comments that were distributed to the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, at our March 21st meeting. Um, is there a clicker for the... Uh, the PowerPoint right projector. In the it should be right in that drawer. In the drawer? Yeah. In the drawer. This drawer. There we go. And it probably needs to be on, I imagine. <laughs> the on button usually helps with that. There we go. Okay, so um, so what so what I have for you uh, today um, is kind of a summary of what we know to date. Um, just as a reminder, um, with respect to the rail network in southeast Florida, that purple line represents the CSX rail corridor, which is, of course, owned by a separate corporation than FEC. Uh, but that's where Amtrak, for example, runs today. Um, uh, there's additional service, and it's illustrated on this line. Um, additional Amtrak service, as was mentioned by one of the public um, commenters, uh, has been proposed for, for several years now, actually since 2000, uh, to run on the CSX line from Miami up to West Palm Beach, uh, come across a new uh, connection in West Palm, and then continue north on the FEC uh, with a station in Vero, as well as seven other communities between Stewart and St. Augustine. Um, Tri-Rail service um, runs on the CSX today. Tri-Rail is proposed to be extended onto the FEC. And so you see those two parallel lines to the south. The CSX and FEC are very close to one another, really within just a few blocks in some locations, um, uh, both east and west of I-95, um, up to about Mangonia Park, which is 45th Street. Um, and then the CSX breaks to the west. So you can see how that purple line runs to the west and the FEC continues up the coast. Um, and then, of course, all aboard Florida's project was introduced about two years ago, um, and it's identified in that um, red dashed line. And all aboard Florida is proposed on the corridor that FEC owns uh, from uh, West Palm Beach up to Coco. I'm sorry, from Miami up to Coco. Um, and then um, the company has secured an easement agreement with the state uh, to run along State Road 528, which is the Beachline Expressway, from Coco into Orlando International Airport. Um, and so that easement was granted, uh, I believe, sometime late last year. Um, and uh, there's a contractual agreement between the state and um, FECI for FECI to operate on that corridor. Um, all aboard Florida has suggested long term it could extend perhaps west over to Tampa and north up to Jacksonville. So this map kind of illustrates uh, the, the rail picture, if you will, in southeast Florida. Um, so the proposal from all aboard Florida, who's not here, but we can certainly summarize it, um, and most of you know, but for the, those in the audience that don't, um, what All Aboard Florida has proposed, it's a private rail service um, that's proposed with uh, uh, to operate high-speed intercity passenger rail service, um, the first of its type in the nation. There's no model for this one. Um, the station locations um, proposed in their first phase are Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, and Orlando International Airport. It's a 235-mile route. 
Um, with respect to service frequency, they're proposing 16 trains per day per hour, so a total of 32 trains on the corridor, um, roughly from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, the company has consistently indicated it anticipates it would begin construction within 2014 um, and then begin service in 2016. What's frustrating is that's caused um, perhaps a higher level of panic um, amongst the public and local governments um, than is um, helpful for a rational discussion about reviewing a project proposal like this one. Um, what's frustrating for the Regional Planning Council and, and certainly for groups like the Commission and the City is that normally we're all used to dealing with large-scale transportation projects like this one where they're proposed by a public agency. So there's a very rational set of public outreach activities that take place. Lots of workshops and lots of meetings with the public and we can all review the plans. And then there's a very long process that goes along um, for several years where there's a lot of opportunity for formal public input. Um, this project, of course, is not following that model because it's not being proposed by a public agency. Um, and so the process that's associated with the project is very different than the one that we're all accustomed to. Um, and that is a, um, an environmental impact statement process, as it was mentioned earlier, that was preceded by an environmental assessment. Um, those are much narrower projects with respect to public input. Um, it's much narrower with respect to public outreach requirements. Um, and so the Regional Planning Council has tried to step in and play a role to facilitate more transparency because the process doesn't really lend itself to that. Um, and so with that, the permit activity that's pending is the issuance of the environmental impact statement that was mentioned earlier. That's the only permit document associated with the activity that's proposed by All Aboard Florida. Um, it's our understanding that in the absence of a RIF loan application, which the, is the Railroad Rehabilitation and Improvement Fund loan that's been requested by All Aboard Florida, there likely would be no permit activity. Um, so there would be no public process. Uh, there's not a permit required, as we understand, to double track the corridor. There's not a permit required to improve the grade crossings. Um, and there's not a permit, these are through the Federal Railroad Administration, there's not a permit required for any of the bridge impacts because they're considered rehabilitation of those existing bridges and not new bridge construction. Um, and so aside from the requirement to address listed species, which there certainly are some, but not, um, not a high quantity because it's an existing developed rail corridor, um, you know, there really would be very limited opportunity for public discussion. Um, and so the environmental impact statement, um, I think at this point, most agencies like the Regional Planning Council would suggest, thank goodness there's an environmental impact statement because there's at least a public discussion required in some way. Um, and so with that, a little summary, um, again, many of those on the commission are familiar with the history, but this is at least pulled together in one place for the members of the public that aren't aware. Um, FECI announced the project back in March of 2002. Um, they submitted a RIF loan application, as we understand, um, back in 2002 sometime. Um, the Federal Railroad Administration, which is the agency that received that application, has indicated um, all documents related to the RIF loan are confidential, including the date the application was submitted, but they were able to confirm that it was submitted in 2012, um, and that triggered the need for environmental impact statement to be developed. Um, as Mr. Bush mentioned, the Federal Railroad Administration is the entity responsible for developing the EIS, and they're utilizing information that's been provided from All Board Florida and its consultants that are working on the project. Um, there was um, uh, an initial, I'm sorry, it's not in, um, the, the third bar I see in my, uh, in my graph there is, is off in my table. Um, there wasn't an EIS document um, uh, submitted, but an environmental assessment, so that should read EA, which is very different frankly, a much narrower and simpler document. Um, so an environmental assessment document was submitted in October of 2012, and it was uh, uh, received approval um, in early 2013. Um, again, that document is fairly narrow. It addressed the double tracking improvements from West Palm Beach to Miami, but it did not address bridge impacts, and it did not address station locations. Um, and the double tracking to the south is an improvement that's long been identified as an improvement desired by many um, in South Florida because of the desire to introduce commuter rail service um, as well as uh, the anticipated uh, incoming uh, freight um, when the Panama Canal is ultimately completed, um, which may be 2016 or maybe it'll be 2018. Um, it will likely happen, though. The expectation is at some point in the future. And there will be a need for more rail capacity to handle the freight that's going to be coming in, particularly to the Port of Miami and Port Everglades. Um, 
So that said, um, in uh, May of last year, the FRA, which is the Federal Railroad Administration, and I'll apologize for the acronyms, but we would be here hours if I wasn't able to use some acronyms, so I'll try to define them all, um, but use them going forward. Uh, so the, the FRA uh, conducted scoping meetings for the environmental impact statement back in May of 2013. The Regional Planning Council submitted uh, scoping comments as well as many local governments and agencies. And the scoping process is designed to really broaden the scope, just as the name implies, um, where um, without public input, the scope of the document may be narrow. Uh, the purpose of those meetings is to broaden the scope to ensure that the EIS document addresses all the different things that are raised by the public, by agencies like the Regional Planning Council, by local governments and others. Uh, so the Regional Planning Council submitted a fairly lengthy scoping letter asking the FRA again to broaden the scope to consider lots of additional things like Amtrak service, which has long been identified as a desire um, along the corridor. Uh, the, um, the opportunity to add additional stations uh, to the existing AAF schedule as proposed to provide some benefits to other communities within the Treasure Coast north of Palm Beach County and West Palm where the one station is proposed. The impact on traffic circulation, impact on marine navigation, um, and other factors like that. Impacts on the downtowns, existing improvements in the downtowns. All things, again, that the Regional Planning Council said, gosh, when you complete the EIS, we'd like you to address all these many things that we have heard about as a Regional Planning Council, um, and others did the same. Um, so that said, what's on the horizon now? Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration has been developing the EIS over the past six months or so, 12, uh, eight months, I guess. Um, their staff indicates they expect the EIS to be published in its draft form, which will be the first version we receive it in, um, in the April, in the March-April timeframe. Um, so they've continued to maintain April sometime. So we're expecting maybe April or May, perhaps, the document will be published. Um, it's first published in a form that's called a draft environmental impact statement or a draft EIS. Uh, the, uh, the process uh, requires a 45-day period for public comment. The Regional Planning Council has requested that public comment time frame be extended, extended to 90 days because the project has such a significant impact uh, potentially in the region. Um, and so after that public comment period, 45 days, 90 days, or whatever period of time the FRA determines is appropriate, um, the agency will receive those public comments. It then is required to modify the document and address those comments. That's how the modification would take place. Um, the agency would then publish what's called a final EIS. There's another public comment period that goes into effect after that. I think by, um, by code it's 30 days, but the FRA again has a discretion to extend that if it deems appropriate. Um, and then the agency would issue what's called a record of decision. And that record of decision is the conclusion, if you will, of that environmental impact statement process. Um, there is then again another appeal time frame that presents itself, although it's not the typical agency public comment period, it moves into the, the court of law after the after record of decision is, is issued. Um, so that's the process. Um, typically, an EIS process, as we understand it, would take maybe three to five years on a project of this magnitude. It's a really substantial time frame. Um, and uh, the FRA staff that we've spoken with have heard extensively from members of the public. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of um, presumption the project is ready to go and they're going to begin construction tomorrow. Um, and actually, there's a fairly lengthy time frame, both in code and the requirement to address all those public comments. That's really going to extend the time frame a bit. Um, so we have some room to, um, uh, to make those comments uh, known. With respect to council's involvement in the project, um, as uh, Mr. Bush has suggested, we've been out trying to, uh, um, to help folks understand at least the process and what our opportunities are. As you all know, of course, I was here, I think it was last month or maybe two months ago. Um, and so we've, um, we've been on the road quite a bit um, trying to help folks understand there's a project that's in process, there's a process that relates to it, and, um, um, and uh, the environmental impact statement, of course, has kind of a structure that has to be followed. Um, and we're continuing to do that. Um, we, uh, um, we have a lot of requests from local governments and from different groups where we're making similar presentations just to help folks understand kind of where the project is. Um, with respect to the Regional Planning Council activity, as Mr. Bush had noted, on March 21st, uh, the council had a chance to at least take a first formal action related to the project. And that action was in the form of um, three, uh, three things that are listed on this slide. 
One was to assemble all the things that the council has heard in doing public outreach, put them in one place, um, and transmit those comments, uh, that list of things, if you will, to the FRA, to ask the FRA to be sure that these things are addressed at a minimum as it finalizes the EIS document. Um, you all have a copy of that. I think there's 24 or 25 different items that are noted. Um, they're um, in uh, seven or eight categories, passenger rail stations, grade crossings and quiet zones, bridges and marine navigation, um, access to broadband capacity, freight rationalization, and I'll touch on each of these in just a moment, land use and transportation, um, access negotiations to enable tri-rail service to go forward, um, and wildlife impacts. Um, secondly, Council asked the public comment period be extended to 90 days. And third, uh, the Council requested FRA conduct some workshops down in the region. This is a very large project. It's not being sponsored by a public agency. They're the public agency responsible, and there are more questions than answers, frankly, about the project. And that list of questions is growing. Um, and so the Council felt it was appropriate to ask the FRA to come on down and hold some public workshops. We can all understand what the process is, what the opportunities are for public comment, and frankly, be better positioned to carry out our job as public agencies, um, because again, it's new territory for us. Um, with respect to those individual points, as has been mentioned, uh, Amtrak service has long been um, expected, if you will, along the FEC corridor. So the types of things Council um, put into its um, uh, correspondence to the FRA, please consider advancing the Amtrak service immediately to bring some benefits with respect to passenger rail. And also many communities have asked for additional stations along the corridor. Uh, we already have three additional stations that have been identified um, in the region. Those are in Stewart, Fort Pierce, and Vero. So consider those um, as you carry out your task in finishing the EIS. Uh, with respect to grade crossing and quiet zones, there's a lot of activity, particularly to the south, the south with respect to quiet zones. Those communities have simply been working on these issues for a longer period of time than some of the northern counties have. Um, and so council's comments related to getting quiet zone funding, either from DOT or in, in partnership between DOT and FECI, and helping to secure grant funds to bring down the cost for local governments, ideally to zero, um, to uh, look at pedestrian pathways along the grade crossing. There's a lot of pedestrian activity. So to make it safe for folks to cross, there needs to be some infrastructure to let pedestrians know where they're mm -hmm. supposed to go. And that's not the middle of the track, but it's at the grade crossing. Um, and um, there's a fee schedule that all local governments are complying with that varies from place to place with respect to how much local governments pay for maintaining their grade crossings. Um, it's not consistent, and it doesn't seem particularly fair. Um, and so the request is that be considered as part of this EIS document to create better um, consistency and um, uh, and uh, forecasting for local governments to deal with those costs going forward. Um, with respect to bridge and marine navigation, uh, bridge and marine navigational impacts, um, as, as Mr. Bush has suggested, though they aren't as paramount perhaps in the northern counties, to the south there are three movable bridges on the corridor. They're in Stewart where the St. Lucie River is, in Jupiter to Cuesta with the Loxahatchee River Bridge, um, and in Fort Lauderdale with the new river bridge. Um, there are significant both navigational impacts as well as economic ones related to additional closures uh, for those bridges. And so there are a whole host of issues that are raised in Council's comments um, relating to impacts on those bridges, the opportunity to synchronize trains. If you close once for passenger, a freight train passes at the same time. So you don't have to close open and then reclose the bridge. Um, to modernize the bridges, which tend to get stuck on occasion. Um, and so um, having a bridge stuck in the closed position is a tremendous impact. Maybe there's an opportunity to modernize or ultimately um, significantly improve those bridges long term. Um, and also there are some particular safety issues um, around the Loxahatchee River Bridge. There's a police fire boat on one side, but it can't get across that bridge um, if the bridge is in the lowered position. Uh, so addressing that uh, issue directly. With respect to broadband capacity, as I mentioned when I was here for the um, for your one of your earlier meetings, there's an opportunity um, with um, FECI who will be installing um, high uh, high speed fiber optic uh, broadband um, service throughout the corridor for discounted access to be provided for certain public users or public go goods, if you would, local governments, emergency service delivery, hospitals, educational users, and uh, biotech, biomed users. Um, have all been identified by through various entities as, um, uh, as users that need better 
high-tech, uh, rather high-speed fiber optics. There's an opportunity for that to be provided as part of the project. Um, with respect to freight rationalization, that term really relates to the ability to adjust freight and passenger service on the two rail corridors we have. They're both owned by private companies. FEC is a private corporation, and CSX is controlled privately as well. Um, but if we're looking at the large-scale southeast Florida region, um, there's an opportunity to balance freight demand on those two corridors to ideally lessen the impact where we have the existing population corridor, which is on the FEC side. Um, and so uh, Council's comments relate to that and ask also that a long-term forecast be developed that looks at maybe 20 years out, how much freight do we really anticipate? How much passenger service do we anticipate? And where will those two types of rail um, activities be occurring um, as they come into southern ports? We don't want it all coming through downtowns if we can avoid that. Out west, there aren't as many people, then maybe there's a little more room. Um, so that issue is raised for the FRA's consideration. Land use and transportation impacts, only two more categories. Um, so land use and transportation impacts, clearly the FEC corridor runs through existing historic downtowns. Many of them came to be because there was a train station, and so there's a lot of activity that centers around that train corridor, the rail corridor. Um, as a result, uh, there are some very intense parking and landscaping issues that are occurring sometimes in least right-of-way from the FEC. That's how those downtowns are now surviving economically. Taking it away with double tracking will have a direct material impact on the ability for those downtowns to survive. Um, there are property value concerns that have been raised, um, and there are traffic and emergency response impacts that have been um, raised as concerns as well. Um, and then other issues, um, impacts on wildlife and listed species. Uh, the corridor traverses some state parks um, and preservation areas, and so there's a risk for greater impacts to wildlife and listed species. There's not a benefit cost analysis that's been made public yet, um, and so council raised that um, as a request through the EIS process. Um, and again, finally, um, extending the public comment period to 90 days. So that is a laundry list of the things that, that we've been hearing of as, um, as the council's been conducting public outreach. So we raised all these things for the FRA. We're a little outside of the scoping time frame, but council felt it was necessary and appropriate to raise these issues now anyway, because um, uh, clearly the EIS is, we believe, getting ready to be issued, and we don't want to be shy about the things that we've been hearing about. Um, three other points just for you, a slide apiece. Um, the uh, other things that have been happening lately, um, on April the 8th, the FRA, again, the Federal Railroad Administration, issued a safety report um, that looked at the diagnostic considerations for that portion of the corridor lying from West Palm Beach north to Cocoa. Um, when I was here previously, I mentioned their diagnostic field reviews that had been taking place from Miami all the way up now to St. Lucie County. Indian River and Brevard County are actually scheduled for these diagnostic field reviews to occur. The estimate is in the month of July. The purpose of those diagnostic field reviews is to look at grade crossings and determine what additional infrastructure from a safety standpoint is necessary to allow uh, the All Aboard Florida project to carry forward. Um, and so based on those field reviews, which were conducted by FECI plus uh, the Department of Transportation, FDOT, and the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, and local governments. We attended some to get an understanding of what the, what the reviews were like. Um, the FRA has issued a safety report that was pretty extensive. Um, it focuses on that portion of the corridor from West Palm north to Cocoa. That's considered the high-speed portion of the corridor because the trains can run up to 110 miles an hour. So they have to maintain a different level of safety, um, uh, safety infrastructure because they're higher-speed trains. Uh, what the report noted is trespassing is an epidemic along the corridor, um, and we know there's lots of evidence of that. When you drive along the corridor, you can see where the paths are, and you, sometimes you see folks crossing the track. Um, my heart sinks when I see that because it's scary, um, and you wish it didn't happen. Um, the FRA called that out as a particular concern because there's so much population along the corridor and asked that that be addressed um, as an issue when the project is ultimately developed. Um, the FRA also indicated um, it, its expectation was, its recommendation was, all aboard Florida should pay for, should fund pedestrian gates wherever there are sidewalks that lead up to those grade crossings, um, and also that the entire corridor should follow the guidelines that are for a sealed corridor. And this is a term of art that I always use quotations for because there's not really a set definition. That said, there are guidelines that really raise the level of safety, and they tend towards four quadrant gates as really a default along the corridor. Um, in the report, there are 41 of the grade crossings that are identified for four quadrant gates. 
Um, another seven identified for 100 foot, what are called non-traversable non medians. The good news for that type of infrastructure is that pretty much qualifies those grade crossings for quiet zones. There's not much additional infrastructure necessary. Um, there are six that were identified for three quadrant gates and 23 that were either private or recommended for closure. For the most part, those are far to the south where there's a much higher intensity of grade crossings. Um, in the good news category, what that means is the FRA recommendations make it much easier and less expensive for local governments for quiet zones to be established if they so choose. Um, and so this report is a public record. It's in the council's communications packet. Um, and um, certainly if you have not received it yet, we would be happy to forward it. We forwarded it to um, the recipient list for the council's agenda distribution list. Um, third point, and Mr. Busher raised this as well, um, what um, uh, uh, the Regional Planning Council is going to, to do is to uh, utilize its own website as a clearinghouse for information. Since there is no agency, there's no public agency locally or regionally that's responsible for the project. So the Regional Planning Council is stepping into that role to make it easier and more rational for folks to get information and to contact folks regarding the project. Um, and so we're in the process of assembling um, this portion of our website. Uh, it's intended to be a central and convenient location for official project-related documents and reports, things like the EIS report, agency reports that are published related to the project, um, and local government comments um, and agency comments that are published. It will also include a project status and timeline because there's really no place to go to get that otherwise. So hopefully it'll make it easier for folks to at least understand what the process is and when comments are due, for example, because that's probably the most important part of that. Um, and the third part is to include um, project-related contact information. And there's, there's a whole host of agencies that have a formal responsibility with regards to the project. Um, the federal agencies are either commenting agencies or they're called cooperating agencies. And they're responsible for um, project-related impacts in their area of responsibility. Um, and so all that contact information will be there and convenient. The congressional delegation, the legislative delegation, the local governments, the MPOs, the TPOs, the water management districts, and FDOT. They all have formal roles with respect to the project. So it's easier for folks to communicate concerns if they have them to the agencies responsible for producing comments uh, on record uh, for the FRA's consideration. And finally, and there wasn't going to be a finally. So and finally, um, the Regional Planning Council, of course, has been receiving a lot of public comments. Uh, kind of the recent uh, list of co public comments are noted here. We've received correspondence from uh, several congressmen, um, uh, Patrick Murphy, uh, Lois Frankel, Bill Posey, as well as several local governments. Um, I, I should, uh, it should be noted from Indian River County, Commissioner Solari, for example, penned a letter um, from the um, from Indian River County that raised a number of issues related to financial questions that just have gone unanswered. It's a beginning list, uh, but there's a lot of uh, financial question marks, frankly, um, that folks have raised. And so uh, Commissioner Solari pulled those together um, and uh, drafted a very, a very detailed list of things um, uh, for the FRA to consider. Um, as, um, as the project is evaluated. Um, and again, a starting list. Um, all of the comments that we've received are always included in the council's communication package. So for example, in this month's agenda, um, all, of these, um, uh, all of these letters and resolutions are included in the communications package uh, and can be downloaded fairly easily just with a click on the website. Um, and so with that, we're happy to answer questions if you have them. I know it was a lot of information, but there's been kind of a lot going on, okay? Commission members, questions? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. I was reading uh, t this week about the lease uh, that's been executed between the state and um, on the 528 corridor going to Coco. In reading between the lines there, it assumes there's going to be a station in Coco. Um, yeah, there's. A, uh, I'll try to speak to that. Yep. So, um, so there are there are eight Amtrak stations mm -hmm. that have been identified, um, and they're actually identified in the state's work program. Um, and they are um, in Coco, as well as Melbourne, uh, Vero Beach, Fort Pierce, and Stewart to the south, and then Titusville, Daytona Beach, and, um, and St. Augustine to the north. Um, Coco is a pivotal station because it provides access to Port Canaveral, um, and there's obviously a very close relationship, for example, with the Disney ships and um, those kinds of connections. Um, and so um, certainly the folks in Brevard County and Coco are advocating for a station there. Um, the Regional Planning Council's position has been all of those Amtrak stations should be receiving service. They've all been planned by local governments and endorsed. Um, and, and yes, there's opportunity for that station to to land in Coco at some point. Well, my reading of it was it was a condition of the lease. My reading of it. 
We didn't. Well, uh, in I, our I, view, we haven't read it. As maybe I maybe I speed read too much, but, so, but um, it would seem to me that if Coco is part of it, and you know, there's a real need to connect, and Disney has the interest uh, that it's going to have a double track going there. That, that likelihood is there would be a movement to put a station in Coco and have this this extension, which is the only new track being laid. Correct. Um, the, the only new right away being laid. Uh, that, that would be a, that would be a stop there. Well, I read it as opportunity. Opportunity that was okay. emphasized in the in the agreement, but you know, it can be read in another. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm reading between the lines that sometimes agreements have understandings. Sure, we weren't party to those discussions. I, I, I know that. I you know, but but Mr. <laughs> but, Bushy said you were up there uh, talking to them. I was wondering if that yeah. came up in the conversation. Uh, uh, I, I, what I can tell you is that within Brevard County, the level of interest in passenger rail service is extremely high. Um, there are three station locations identified on the Amtrak corridor. Um, Titusville, Coco, and Melbourne. They are priorities within each of those jurisdictions. Uh, the Chamber, the League of Cities, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Space Coast TPO, um, Brevard County. Um, among, among folks along the corridor that are strong advocates for passenger rail, I would suggest to you it's probably the highest in Brevard County. Mm -hmm. um, and that port connection is just critical um, because it opens the door in a place where they've had a lot of economic loss um, and tourist access has been very highly prioritized by the folks that are dealing with the closures at the base. Right. So. One, one further thing. We've had conversations um, in the last couple of months about uh, to partially fund quiet zones if there was a requirement that local governments fund quiet zones that would be an application for, for Tiger Grant. My understanding is the total amount available for Tiger Grants is about $10 billion. Uh, $600 million in this funding cycle. $600 million, it's yeah. all? So. Well, maybe it was the loan area that I was thinking about. That, well, I heard that there was a $75 billion worth of applications for a $10 billion pot. Have you heard that? I read um, that somewhere this week. Uh, that's not consistent with the data that I've seen. Okay. Um, what, what we've seen is um, uh, there's a $600 million allocation for Tiger in this round, which is a 20% increase from last year. It was a $500 million allocation previously. Um, typically, it's about a 10 to 1 ratio. Um, applications versus um, okay. available funding. Um, there, um, there is precedent for a Tiger grant for quiet zones, um, although the details of that grant remain confidential. Uh, we've spoken with the town manager in the town of Windsor, um, and that was a public-private agreement uh, that enabled that Tiger grant to be submitted. And so while the manager was um, able to describe some of the details to me, um, it was emphasized that the Tiger grant application itself remained confidential because it had confidential information from the railroad that was the partner. That was a little Tiger grant, $2.6 million. Uh, in the scale of Tiger Grants. Um, there is an application that's being developed now uh, from Palm Beach and Broward counties. Um, uh, it will be uh, to establish a quiet zone from the southern end of one county to the northern end of the other, so the entire two counties. Um, they have the most grade crossings per mile of anywhere along the corridor, and it's the most urban stretch of development, really, the most residential. Um, and so quiet zones in those communities have been talked about for 20 years. Um, in fact, several of them have been down the path with FRA trying to get quiet zones established in the past several years before All Aboard Florida was even proposed. Mm. Um, and so the conversation is very mature um, in those counties. Um, the MPOs have allocated funds, and that Tiger Grant application will be submitted next week. Uh, the deadline is Friday. Doesn't mean there can't be a future Tiger Grant application for the northern counties if that's determined to be a need. And hopefully if the one to the south is funded, then we'll have a precedent. You said there were, they had frequent crossings per mile. How many crossings per mile did they have? 118 in Palm Beach County. and um, Per mile? 118 total in Palm Beach County. There's, there are 118 grade crossings in Palm Beach County, and there are 78 in Broward. So that is, um, let's see, almost 200 grade crossings of the 352 in the entire corridor uh -huh. are in Palm Beach and Broward County. And I can quickly calculate a, a mileage estimate, but in looking at the map, there are a whole lot of grade crossings for not as much land area as you Palm wish. Palm Beach County is 45 miles. 45 miles long, yeah, because we have a we have about we have three grade crossings per mile in Barrow Beach. Yeah, 118. It's 36 alone in the city of West Palm Beach. Yeah. So there just is a very robust network, and there's a lot of grade crossings. So, and I'll do a quick calculation. I should have that number in my head too. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? I, I have a question on the time frame. Who is the individual that's actually going to grant us the extra time? 
Well, John Winkle is my contact in FRA. Yes. Um, and um, John's a transportation industry specialist. I have his contact information if the commission doesn't have it already. Um, and um, uh, he is responsible for coordinating the EIS process. Um, and um, and so he's the lead staff contact. Yes. But I, I, I couldn't suggest to you that we know who within FRA would make the judgment call with respect to extending the time frame. Uh, Mr. Winkle is very aware of the dialogue um, in our region. Um, I, I'm on the phone with him at least twice a week now. Um, and we send him all of the correspondence that we receive. We send it directly to Mr. Winkle to make sure that he's fully aware um, of the dialogue um, that is um, underway in our part of the state. Um, uh, he understands that um, the council's position is to request um, a time extension to 90 days. Yes. I'm not aware that there's a precedent for a public comment period to be doubled. Um, but, I see. But we're making our best effort at trying to get more time, and that's the best way to do it. And, and what you may notice is the correspondence that you have is a document, um, is a letter addressed directly to Mr. Winkle, and he is the point person within FRA. Ms. Chan has, thank you, Ms. Chan has a question. Um, one, of the, one of the things that has been discussed locally is, of course, the extension, but has the uh, Regional Planning Council asked or considered <coughs> that there should be individual county meetings rather than a larger meeting where all counties are expected to come together? Uh, the Council's request was for the FRA to conduct workshops, plural, in the region. Um, it, it didn't take it to the point where there was a request for seven, for example, for the seven counties in southeast Florida or eight. Um, we could certainly extend that if the commission would would request that uh, the council could consider that or the commission could ask directly. Um, we haven't gotten any feedback yet on those on those I'll requests. I'll send you our letter. We've so. requested that sure. as well. So, yeah. But it's, again, I mean, this is a project that we have no precedent. It's not a public agency. And there's an enormous amount of interest, and there's not a lot of opportunity to interact formally. Um, and so certainly public workshops conducted by the agency responsible seem to make some sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a big region. I, I 250, would, 250 miles. Thank you. Would request um, possibly if next time you're on the phone with the fellow just to maybe feel him out a little bit to find out kind of when we may know if we are going to be granted the extra days to kind of give us a little idea because um, there are a lot of concerns in our area as throughout the other counties. You know, people are hoping for the extra time and if you could just let the fellow know. And also, we have a lot of people in this community that have a lot of concerns uh, that are going to want to come up to address you know, at the appropriate time at the public hearing. Sure. And we would really, really like to have one here uh, at this county. I know the county commissioners probably will be in favor. I, I know the city council. We talked about it last night. Sure. And, and I should mention that, um, and I failed to mention, uh, my apologies, the, the workshops the council has requested would be ahead of the issuance of the draft EIS document. Mm -hmm. This would just be to help folks understand the process that's ahead of us. In addition, the FRA is required, once the draft EIS is published, to hold <coughs> workshops along the corridor. Um, and what they, they've told us is they would be they would expect to hold five or six. I'm sorry, they're not workshops. They're public meetings. Um, and, and the semantics are important, I guess. But they're, um, they're public meetings to, um, to take public comment on the project in person from folks. Um, that public comment, of course, can be submitted in writing or by email as well. Uh, but they would be staffed by Federal Railroad Administration staff, as well as I would presume all aboard Florida um, would be participating as well. And they are expressly for public comment on the EIS once it's been issued. The, the workshops that we're asking for are before you issue it, please come down and help us all understand the process that's coming so we can be more knowledgeable mm -hmm. when we're talking to members of the public and, and our councils, et cetera. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? W one other quick question. The uh, State Road 528, the right-of-way uh, that All Aboard Florida has been working with the FDOT people with, in reading the lease agreement, is the rail line that's going to be placed there just going to be for high speed only? Or are they going to, if they wanted to use it for freight, could they use it for freight too? As we've read the document, it appears that it's only for passenger rail at this stage. 
but at this stage. The document only speaks to passenger rail, and, there, and there's, anyone can take that status and carry it forward. I mean, there's folks that have suggested it ultimately could be for cargo as well. Uh, there's nothing in the document that states that, though. So we know that FECI has indicated in other public meetings they run their freight up to Coco and then they truck it mm -hmm. to Orlando. So um, we'd, we wouldn't know where that goes. We wouldn't be the ones to be able to comment on that right. as a okay. council. You mentioned that the FRA is doing its own EIS rather than having the applicant do the EIS. It, what we understand in speaking with their staff uh -huh. is that the process requires, because a RIF loan application was submitted, that the agency produce an environmental impact statement, okay? Okay. And that environmental impact statement is informed by data that is produced and provided by FECI, all aboard Florida, to the agency. And the agency then is responsible for <laughs> reviewing the, um, the, <coughs> the list of improvements that are proposed, the data that's been provided, and they review that against all the federal regulations that are um, uh, that are. Um, required to be addressed in the EIS. Um, impacts on life safety, impacts on traffic circulation, listed species, uh, uh, stormwater issues, wetlands, uh, water supply, noise and vibration. There's a fairly substantial list of things. I believe one of your earlier speakers actually went through. Um, yeah, I, I understand that, but I'm concerned in, in the following thing. An agency that produces a document is in a stronger, uh, I would have more interest in defending that document than if the document was prepared by another agency and they were just evaluating it. So they'd be evaluating their own document, and I'm really concerned about that. It's, I, I think there are others that share that concern as well. But yeah. procedurally, that's the, that's the process as we understand it. I had another question. You made reference to an on-site engineering field report, part one. Mm -hmm. What's your professional opinion on page two? One, two, the third paragraph, the engineer speaks, in my professional opinion, I respectfully disagree with the project's approach and that they are not ex exercising appropriate safety practices and reasonable care when designing for high-speed rail passenger. All right, so I can speak on, on behalf of Council's review, let's say. Okay. Um, and we've spoken directly with Mr. Fry. In fact, met him in the field and reviewed, uh, spent two days with him in the field understanding the agency's approach with respect to the grade crossings. Uh, the concern that he expressed... Um, in the report is consistent with our discussion. Um, the FRA expects the, 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 the official recommendation of the FRA is the quarter be held to the highest level of safety standards, which are set forth in the sealed quarter guidelines. Um, and that is a higher level of safety infrastructure than the All Aboard Florida team had indicated it wanted to install. So, so that's where the that's where okay. the Federal Railroad Administration's recommendation falls. Now, what happens going forward is a bit uncertain. It appears that, based on our discussions with the various staffs, FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, is ultimately um, the final arbiter, if you will, with respect to what must be installed. So that document that you referred to is the safety recommendation re report from the Federal Railroad Administration. But they aren't the ones with final authority. The ones with final authority, as we understand it, are the Florida Department of Transportation. Is the Florida Department of Transportation, and they have not responded yet to that report. Thank you. And back to the Road 528 right of way. From le reading the lease agreements, that looks pretty much taken care of. They, you know, have to finalize some other situations. And it was my understanding from reading that All Aboard Florida, they were the only bidder. So that part of their project. Uh, because they, when you go through the paperwork and you read it, they received unanimous support from the, the uh, body up that way as far as an approval process. So I'm, is that correct in my thinking that that's pretty much a done deal? We're not aware that there's any additional step necessary. Okay. And there are two separate agreements. One is with FDOT and the other is with the, um, the Orlando Airport Authority. Yes. Orlando International okay. Airport Authority. Um, one of the things that... Uh you just said what concerns me. We have not been going and encouraging lobbying or communication with the Florida DOT. Well, if Florida DOT is the one that's going to be determining the safety levels on these crossings, 
would it be would it make sense for you from a planning's point of view that we should be communicating with Florida DOT about how important it is that these safety measures that are recommended by FRA be installed within the state of Florida? Because I, I understand that there's a difference in, right. in what, this, what the state requires and what the federal uh, FRA requires. And, and the council is in constant communication okay. with the Department of Transportation on this project and all transportation projects. Have you had any response from them? You just uh, said no. Well, they, the FDOT has not yet responded right. to the safety report that was issued by FRA. We would expect that response in writing right. within the next week or two. Uh, the safety report was just issued last week. Could you send us a copy of that when we get it? Uh, oh, absolutely. It'll be in Council's communications package. Thank you. And certainly we'll send Very it to good. the Thank Commission you. as well. So um, I failed to follow up on a second point. When I was here previously, there were two key issues you asked me to follow up on. One was a copy of the quiet zone application from the town of Windsor, and unfortunately it remains confidential and it can't be released uh, by the, per, per our discussions with the manager. The second was what portions of the corridor does TriRail operate at 79 miles per hour? Um, and, from, and when I spoke with TriRail, they said they can operate at 79 on all of the corridor and they routinely operate across most of the corridor at up to 79 miles per hour uh, with no conflicts. So that was a, a question that was raised, and my apologies. I realize I'm here and I didn't follow up directly, so apologies for that. I, okay. One other question uh, for folks that are thinking about a station in, throughout uh, different areas, uh, this county and maybe other counties. Uh, with high-speed rail, it's my understanding there's going to be extra security measures that will be put in place when you have these particular stations, and the four stations that they have in mind are actually, uh, number one, the areas are quite large where the stations are going. And when the folks come in to get onto the high-speed train, it's going to be in a particular area. Could you please go into a little bit of details how that's going to work with Homeland Security? Sure. There, there, uh, it would be much easier if Amtrak and All Aboard Florida could operate in the same type of station configuration. Um, that is not the case as we understand it. The Amtrak stations that were planned along the corridor, um, for example, the one in Vero, um, are, are considered, um, they're considered caretaker stations for the most part, which are very simple and inexpensive stations to design. Yes. Uh, they require a platform, a covered platform. Ticketing occurs on the platform, and if the stations are staffed, they're staffed locally. Often in many communities, it's a member of the Parks Department or somebody from Main Street, maybe a local business, a local rail enthusiast takes on the responsibility. Uh, local historic societies often take on the role of staffing those stations when the train's coming in, and then they greet people, and people get on and off, and then the train leaves, and then they don't have to staff the station any longer. Um, chambers of Commerce often take that space um, so that they can greet folks when they come in. Um, so that's the Amtrak configuration. Amtrak needs a 1,000-foot um, a, a platform, same platform dimension. Uh, Vero's station was recommended to be um, utilizing the property where the existing historic station is located, but actually not touching that building because there's no need to interfere with that building. Um, and the recommendation was for a platform to be constructed adjacent to the building, um, could be staffed by the historic society or others. This was the discussion that I recall. Um, the parking in that location could be used both for Amtrak service or museum patrons. Um, and um, and the station would exist as a caretaker station, which is what Amtrak recommended as the appropriate station scale for six of the eight stations proposed on the corridor. Stewart's and, and Fort Pierce is the same. Um, all aboard Florida stations, by contrast, as you mentioned, are, are a bit different. Um, they, um, as we understand it, uh, all aboard Florida's service requires compliance with Homeland Security. I don't know why there's a difference, and I'm trying to understand the difference, but nonetheless, all aboard Florida's passengers are required to go through security clearance, much like the airport, where you go through a, um, a metal detector, and there's formal baggage handling that's going to be provided by All Aboard Florida Service. One of the reasons we were able to find these caretaker less expensive stations for six of the eight communities is that Amtrak doesn't have to have baggage handling, so you just take your suitcase on this train and you go. All Aboard Florida Service will operate at a higher level of concierge service, which includes formal baggage handling. That requires their stations be staffed, baggage handling be addressed, and because there's security clearance necessary, all of their stations that are proposed at this point are two-story stations where you would go into the building, you would clear security at some point, and you would be actually in a waiting area 
waiting for the station to come in when the train, <coughs> when the, waiting for the train to come in, when the train comes in, you'd actually drop down and you would already have cleared security, if you will. Um, so that requires staffing for those stations more extensively than Amtrak. There are no stations that are proposed to be staffed part-time, which is one of the ways we could find some efficiencies with the Amtrak service. Instead, if there are, let's say there were four trains a day that stopped in Vero, then that station would probably have to be staffed pretty much all day um, during the hours of operation. Um, all aboard Florida is certainly proposing to carry those costs for all of its stations. It's a private project, and the local yes. governments aren't participating. The Amtrak service was designed in a different way, more of kind of a public-public private set of relationships where there'd be a sharing of those responsibilities to bring down the operational costs. Um, and so the Regional Planning Council has suggested stations be added. There's certainly no suggestion that those costs be handled locally. That's part of the project. Um, and I think we're all waiting to see what the response is like to that. All aboard Florida has been consistent in suggesting long term, maybe as service demand grows, it could add additional stations, but that doesn't really give any benefit to the northern counties, as, as councils pointed out. We only get a benefit if we are able to access the service and derive some quality of life improvement, economic mm -hmm. enhancement, et cetera. That's how they're handled differently. And the other question I had, uh, in your travels, have you had other communities concerned with the speed coming through their city? We have the rail here. It's not too far from this building. It cuts through the heart of our downtown, and the train's going to be going very fast through this area. Um, any other cities and counties with concerns of speed? Yeah, many communities have raised concerns of speed. Do you, in your professional opinion, when the EI comes out, how could those issues be addressed where it could go into the study for the folks to take a look at to possibly slow the train down if it actually does come? And, 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 and we don't know how it will be addressed in the EIS. Okay. Certainly it's one of the things that the, the council staff will evaluate when we have a chance to review the document and, and you all the same. Okay, so. thank you very much. Sure. Anyone else on the commission have questions? Thank you very much for coming, Ms. Delaney. Thank you, sir, Mr. You Mike Busher, for coming. We really appreciate your time. Uh, next on the agenda uh, is number B. Mr. O'Connor and Mr. Falls are here to give us an update on what they know concerning this All Aboard Florida project. Mr. Chairman, I think you've sent out uh, about as much information as we would ever know on the All Aboard, and do appreciate you disseminating that uh, through the <coughs> various folks attachment. The one thing that we are going to do is tomorrow we will have a walkthrough uh, on the uh, crossings. It's not with All Aboard Florida, it's with our legislators to sort of look and talk about the issues that we have. Uh, Monty Falls and myself will be attending that. There was some concern about opening it up to members of the legislative bodies or the commissions because of sunshine law issues. Otherwise, you would have to have a reporter or a court recorder there and some of those things. So we've tried to limit it to where we wouldn't have any violations in those areas. And, and we are, we're really not the ones doing it. It's being proposed from the uh, MPO. And it's my understanding, and Ms. Vock is here, I'm slated to be part of the group. There is no one else coming from this commission, and we got the uh, correspondence went through uh, Mr. Comment's office because people were concerned with members of the same body. But uh, I plan on attending. I uh, started, slated my day to be there, just so you know, but we are aware of the Sunshine situation. Yeah. You brought that up the other night, but it was a long meeting, and I didn't want to pop back up and readdress that. But thank yous. Anything from Mr. Falls? Okay, thank you, sir, for coming up. All right, we're moving into matters. Do we have any matters up here from our members? The only thing that I have, that, and I held it, um, Sometime in May, I will be meeting with uh, some of the folks from the hospital board to uh, go over the high-speed rail situation with them and to hear from them uh, their input on the matter. And I'll bring back a report uh, to this board. I'm hoping uh, to have Ms. Vock there to do minutes for the meeting. And I have to check with her later on on that to see if it's okay. I, go ahead. Could I? Um, I do have one, one thought, and that is we've heard from Mr. Gruber a number of times about um, what we'll need to do as far as the coordination, and Tom, really appreciate all your input into the process and, um, and the, 
that we will have to coordinate across governments. And I hear from Kim that um, they'll be setting up the clearinghouse on the website. Is there a chance that the um, Regional Planning Council would also perhaps serve as a clearinghouse for some of the government agencies to talk uh, across to one another about where, where are we in planning how the cities of Vero Beach and Sebastian and Indian River County are going to coordinate their thoughts on each of the topics that Mr. Gruber brought up. Right. We had, initially we had committed, there was a meeting in Fort Pierce and with the city and the county and the St. Lucie Village folks. And at that meeting, it was a couple of weeks ago now, we had committed to make sure that everybody who has something to say about this project, especially the local governments, um, we're sort of making sure that we get everybody coordinated on that. It isn't, the reason we're doing that is, there's a lot of reasons, but we are also responsible as a regional planning council under federal, it's an A95 federal code of regulations or something to coordinate EIS comments for the region, be the clearinghouse for all those comments. So at one level, we can do that. At the second level, um, I think probably the best thing we could do is organize meetings of those agencies. You have, you have Fish and Wildlife Service right here, right up the street. The core, the Water Management District, anybody else you can think of, FDOT, the MPOs, um, but mainly the committee agencies so that we can set up times for local governments to come and basically hold court with them and sit and ask them. So um, someone how they in feel. each of the governments we can we'll have the opportunity to come to say it's just the environmental impact part of it sure and so somehow at the county you'll be identifying it'd be roland or whoever it is at the county yeah. goes to the meeting i don't know who it would be maybe maybe you monty from the city yeah. and we and then meet with um the people who will be coming from st Lucie village from Port St. Lucie so you, from... So you, everybody okay. understands where now they'll have, there'll be different impacts up and down the corridor. They have different, people have different concerns, but at least you'll understand what they are. And that's the least we could do is offer that. We can't make anybody come to those, but we can yeah. certainly offer that. And one thing you should know about, I know I see Peter here, he's the chair of the Regional Planning Council. Um, you have a Lackalas Mint issue in your corridor. Do you, do you, I'm have sure... A what? I'm sure Ruth knows about it. It's an endangered species that ha that only lives um, at a certain elevation. It's in southern Indian River County, and it only lives in the tracks, the, the track area there. So, I mean, that's a special issue for Indian River County, you know, dealing with that. Others have navigation issues. All I'm telling you is that it's probably a good idea that, so if a local government is working on an issue, you might even find support from a, another local government to help you with that issue that have, has expertise. I know the Regional Planning Council has huge expertise in endangered and threatened species through one of our staff. So and we, we have the archaeological site, which I don't think the other counties right. have right now. As far as we know. But the, the idea will be just what you're suggesting. That's, that's what we are supposed to be doing. Just as want to make sure we're all on track to, to head to the same point. Yeah. Um, you know, that we're all collaborating. Well, and the worst thing that could happen is a, a, a few local governments are actually working cross purposes with, for example, to quest in Jupiter on what they're trying to accomplish. So we will try as best we can to facilitate those meetings and get folks there. And at that point, it's up to the local governments to want to wanna do that, to want to participate and understand what their neighbors are, are going through. And, mm -hmm and maybe include those kinds of things in their comments, you know, as a, as a neighboring local government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to help you out, St. Lucie Village. I mean, you got six crossing and a third central track running through the middle of your town. <coughs> so, I mean, that's a little bit of an issue for them, <coughs> a siding, a center siding being proposed running through the middle of their town. So that small town of St. Lucie Village. So, anyways, a, um, thank you. Ms. I Avery a has a question. Go ahead. I now. have a question. Um, I want to understand something you just said. Mm -hmm. So would you be the clearinghouse for groups 
who want to make comments on the EIS also or just governmental agencies? Um, <coughs> right now, um, I would commit just to working with the local governments. Those groups that have formed out there, and there are several, mm -hmm. I mean, this, the clearinghouse that we would put on our website mm -hmm. would be so that they at least would have all the information everybody else would have uh, related to this project. Okay. But our, our master at this point um, is the local governments and trying okay. to get them to talk. The groups certainly can attend. I, I, I mean, there's, there's several of them that have formed, and we're aware of them, and we speak to them and try and copy them on things that we get. But instead of trying to remember all that, everything we post on the website, and we'll let everybody know when that's ready to go, um, will be available to everybody. Um, those meetings, uh, though, you know, like I said, our master is local governments. That's who we serve. That's who we are, sort of a council of local governments. So to help okay. with communication and coordination, okay. that's, that's our job. Thank so. you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. We have in the audience, and if he doesn't mind, we have Commissioner O'Brien, and I know they've been working very hard also. And if he wouldn't mind coming up and share with us what they're working on a little bit, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, commission. A um, couple of things. Obviously, the, the county has been very engaged in this process. Um, one of the things we have done is we approved a budget amendment and put funds in and have signed a contract with a, uh, an engineering firm, CDM, and they have experience in train engineering uh, projects. So we have them now working for us. Look, when the EIS comes out, they'll be looking at it as um, train engineers on our behalf, and we're looking at the entire county. So it'll include the crossings in the city of Vero Beach, the crossings in Sebastian, and the, the crossings in the uh, unincorporated part of the county. Um, at Tuesday's meeting, um, I, I guess in a little bit of uh, backtracking maybe, but uh, Commissioner Slarry will be going to the Regional Planning Council meeting um, asking that we, um, again, request the Federal Railroad Agency the 45-day uh, the, the extension, which uh, um, they've already covered, Kim and Mike. Um, the, uh, the, the, the resolution to get access to the financial information and the backup that all aboard Florida is using to justify the, uh, the entire loan, one of the concerns Commissioner Slari is pushing is, is that um, if it's not financially feasible, then there's a high chance that the uh, project will default on the loan, leaving the federal taxpayers holding the bag. So Commissioner Slari is kind of spearing that up. Um, other than that, we do have our, our public works engineering staff ready to meet when the, uh, the All Aboard Florida engineering team gets up here to physically look at the uh, crossings. And, and I know that uh, Chris Moore is uh, working with Monty very close on that, so we're coordinating all that. Okay. Um, and, th and that, it, it, I think, kind of we're all in that point of now waiting for that EIS to come out, that there's a lot of things we don't know that hopefully will be cleared up, but we wanted that engineer on board um, Phil Matson, our MPO director, looked at the EIS for the southern half, and it was like <laughs> the, the terminology just didn't make sense to anybody. And, and like, particularly like the sound levels, we asked Phil, "Well, so what is? <laughs> tell us what that means in like decibels or something we all can understand." And it's not in there. And so that's why we want that engineer to be able to translate the, you know, you know the train speak into information that we all can understand and then we can have a, a better evaluation of what those impacts will be to our communities so we're um, we're on top of it. it it's funny it's kind of like lagoon who now or what lagoon it's it's all aaf now so we're uh we're, we're watching it and participating and uh, we'll have staff at the um the uh the tour with the uh delegation as well and uh so we're we're trying to stay on top is it just on top of it just like you all are doing thank you very much commissioner for coming up i appreciate your time sure, no problem Ken. thank you any other questions from the members any other business yeah, mr chairman go right ahead um i i think that uh, we should note that uh, all aboard florida the entity that's 
requested and looking for this, uh, I'm going to put this train through. Um, the reason, I guess, for this commission's existence is uh, this entity, All Aboard Florida, and uh, they aren't here. We've heard from several uh, of the experts that have testified here that uh, the information is sketchy at best. I know that during our first meetings, we had uh, All Aboard here, All Aboard Florida here, and we've asked lots of questions. And uh, Tammy has, I don't know, Tammy is 2,000 pages, a good guess of what's out there in, uh, in documents. But all that information is from lots of places, but not from the entity that wants to build the railroad. The questions that we've asked, this is uh, April, and uh, this commission was formed in what, uh, November? Your first uh, meeting was in January. January. The first meeting was in January. The commission was formed in, back in November, right? Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, there's been questions for several months. And uh, Ken, you've been pretty good about sending out lots of documents, but I haven't seen a lot of answers from all aboard Florida. And I think that if, um, if the limited liability corporation that's going to build this wants to build up some credit with the interested people that are out here watching this, and if they want to build up some credit, one of the things that they need to do is they need to answer questions, and they don't answer any of our questions. And a couple of times where they did give some answers out, it turns out that their answers were inaccurate. And uh, that's the nicest way that I can put it. Um, I think it was something else, but anyway, the answers weren't accurate. And... Uh, with respect to the credit that this company has built up with me, at this point their credit is so bad I wouldn't accept their cash. Um, Houston, we have a problem here. And I, I don't think that we should end a meeting without making sure that the public record notes that uh, All Aboard Florida is uh, woefully short on answers, but they um, they want to um, essentially have this financed 100% by the taxpayers. And I think that if you look at the debt that our governing authorities have uh, mounted on our behalf, it's uh, something in the line of... Uh, $55,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country right now. And um, to add a couple of billion, billion dollars for this railroad to our debt by, uh, by giving them the money without them first giving us some answers is something that we should not do. Um, uh, we have limited opportunities um, given the sunshine law, for members of the commission to share our own concerns uh, with each other. We can ask questions. That's one way of showing concerns. But we, we can't talk to each other outside of meetings, and we don't. But I'd like to share a couple concerns I have, some of which came up uh, today when Kim made the comment about the way the stations were being constructed. We had heard from All Aboard Florida at the beginning that it was critical to them that, that, the, that the time be under three hours or three hours from Miami to, uh, to Orlando or vice versa. Because they had to compete with rail, they had to compete with buses, they had to compete with airlines, and now it looks like they're going to be just like an airline. They're going to you have to go in an hour ahead of time, have your secure, go through security, and then wait in a holding area until the you know the train is, is ready to go. And that's probably at least an hour that adds to this. I'm I'm astounded to hear that. It's the first time I've heard that that's what their stations are are, are going to be like because it does add it adds a lot of time to that supposedly three hour three hour window. 
And this week I also discovered that All Aboard Florida is an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, incorporated in the state of Delaware. And it's a separate corporation from um, the East Coast Incorporated. And I was, from Kim's point out, it seems a dual application for the loan uh, from both FECI and, uh, and All Aboard Florida. I'm concerned that the liability could all be against All Aboard Florida, which if the project does not make money and cannot pay back the loan, that organization just goes belly up and all the infrastructure improvements will be retained by FECI. Uh, at, at full cost of the, of the taxpayers. I'm, I'm really concerned that this may be set up to do that, and we ought to be concerned about that. And, and with that concern, um, if you take a look at the parent company, Fortress, and understand some of the, the people involved when, um, you know, all Aboard Florida is a limited liability corporation, but essentially owned by Fortress. And there, there are some stockholders, but essentially it's owned by Fortress. The um, dig into Fortress, and uh, I'm sure that there are many people that, uh, that remember the uh, 2008 financial crisis that we had in this country. And a lot of that was caused by worthless paper that was put together by uh, Fannie Mae and by some of the Wall Street banks. And then you look at the uh, where did those people go after they created that financial havoc for our country, and you find out that they went to Fortress, the parent company of All Aboard Florida. And as Dan has just pointed out, you start to look at some of these things, and is that note going to be worthless paper? So they get a couple billion dollars worth of assets, default on the loan, and, or, and Fortress, a, a corporation with some 60, 70 billion dollars worth of assets right now, gets a couple extra billion dollars worth of assets, gratis, the uh, I'm thankful to the uh, taxpayers of our of our country and our state and our city, and um, like I said, the uh, um, in, in order in order for me to be confident at all, they've got to build up some credit, and not to be a smart aleck, but at this point, their credit is so low with me that I wouldn't accept their cash. We had an individual raise their hand from the public. If it, you folks don't mind, I'm going to let him come up to share his thoughts. Sir, do you mind, guys? Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. I wasn't going to speak, but what you just... just oh, I'm sorry. Joseph Cafanti. I live at 441 uh, Holly Road in Vero Beach. 32963, for anybody who wants to send me a Christmas card. <clears throat> Include cash? I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the final comments that this gentleman and Brian Hetty, I don't know you, I don't know your name. What is it? I can't read that far. With it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I appreciate the comments. And these are the things that I've been saying uh, for months uh, privately, and I alluded to them public, publicly. Uh, the, the people involved are on the 46th floor of a, a, sto a building on 6th Avenue and it's near 54th Street in Manhattan. These people recently bought the bankrupt railroad up in Canada, I believe, where a bunch of people died because of the uh, cars exploded, whatever they were carrying, and uh, I don't mean be trite about a bunch of people. They were a lot of people were killed, and this company uh, went in and bought the bankrupt railroad, and that's what they do. Uh, uh, they take advantage of situations. These people are well connected. Well, Brian, didn't, I'll say it. I'll try to be brief, but these people are connected to Washington, not the not the mob, but to Washington. And and they they that's where they came from. To, as far as I can see, this is a heist. 
This is an organized heist. These, that's what these people do. They're not creating anything. The, it's true that the, once the improvements are made, who's going to want them if and when uh, Florida, all aboard Florida goes belly up? Who's going to want them? No, nobody can use them. There's a gentleman here and that spoke earlier, the, one of the first guys, and I'd like to ask him if he knows the conditions under which the tracks were ripped up 30, 40 years ago because the way that they were taxed, this is federal and not state, because they ripped them up all over the country. Every place had two tracks, one north-south or one east-west, one east and one west. And they ripped these tracks up and because it was more efficient economically for the railroad to rip these tracks up because of the taxes, the way that the, they were, the, the taxes were changed. I'm not guessing this. I, I know this. I remember this. And I wonder if the gentleman, if he's still here, knows whether or not those rules have been changed as far as double tracking is concerned. Florida um, East Coast is going, is going to benefit from this because they're going to get another set of tracks. I also, I'd like you to do, that's it, but I, I, the bottom line, I foresee it as a, an organized heist. One of the things I think you should look at is, well, two things, the death of, of uh, pedestrians versus ve vehicular deaths, people that die in a train smacking into a car or a truck or a bus, as opposed to pedestrians. And I think you should know what the, what the difference is, how many, I, I've lived here for over 35 years. I don't know of any vehicle that got smacked and anybody died. I'm sure it's happened, but, but I do know that a whole bunch of people have died, pedestrians, for whatever, suicide or whatever it is, uh, over the years. And so these, these, this quiet zone and these tr trying to prevent accidents at the crossing is really a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. It's the pedestrians, the, the, the people that are crossing the tracks here and there, whatever, and I've crossed tracks, and you know, that doesn't matter. But uh, the, uh, uh, anyway, the, that's, that's a problem. There's another issue, if you bear with me one second, I can't keep it to mind. I admire the uh, lady that was here, made the presentation. I'm not gonna be able to find this. I wanted to ask about something else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate that. Okay, yeah, very simple. I would like to see an analyzation of the freight that goes from Miami to Orlando. Right now, as far as I can see, the, somebody just explained it to you that Florida East Coast is bringing it up to Cocoa or someplace and then trucking it over to Orlando as opposed to shipping it up on CSX tracks. It's a different railroad. I'd like to, like to know why anybody would ship, how they could ship something on Florida East Coast to bring it over to Orlando on truck as opposed to shipping it from uh, on CSX. It, they don't have to move the truck. They eventually have to put it on trucks, I guess, over in Orlando. And But how much freight is actually going, and where does the freight go on the CXX line after it leaves Orlando, which Florida East Coast has no, um, has no uh, um, access to? Where does all this freight go that's supposed to, that comes into Miami? And then, you, then the other question is, and Brian, I talk to Brian about, Brian and I talk all the time. Uh, sometimes uh, we listen to each other. But where does, where, where does all this, why, why would the, a ship coming through the canal, going a stop in Florida, when it could continue on to I, I, Savannah or New York or Port Newark or Port Elizabeth in, in New Jersey? Why would, it, why would there be such a tremendous unloading of freight 
in Miami to put it on rails to ship it all the way up to New York. I don't see that happening. So I would think that you think about that a little bit. Well, thank you very much for the third or fourth time. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, Buzzy. Okay, uh, the next meeting dates, which is number eight, May 12th, 2014 at 4 p.m., June 4th, 2014 at 4 p.m. And I'll take a motion to adjourn, please. Some of, yeah. And we have a second. Thank you very much for coming today.